The world needs bread. The world needs bread. According to the Global Hunger Index, 52 countries in the world are hungry. You take the country of Zambia, 41.4% of the people in Zambia wake up every morning wondering if they will just be able to touch a crumb of bread. It's amazing because one out of nine people in the world are hungry. One out of nine. 795 million people in the world can't find bread. They're hungry. It was surprising to me, but in Asia alone, the largest single group of people, 500 million people in Asia alone, wake up every day without bread. This would sound surprising to most of us. Most of us can wake up in the morning and we can go and find bread. Most of us this week, we can go to the grocery store, to the store, or we can pop into 7-Eleven because there's one on every corner, and for about seven Hong Kong dollars, or as I paid the other day at Taste, $9.60, you can buy bread, and you can take it home, and you can have bread. This would sound surprising to us because after church today, you could go to Dan Ryan's and get some Western food. And while you're waiting to order, they will come and they will pour the water and they will bring you some of the best bread you've ever tasted. Or maybe it's the butter that's better than the bread, I'm not sure. This would sound surprising to us that one out of nine people in the world are hungry. Because we could take bread and we would even go to a lake and maybe we would take the bread and we would throw it and the ducks would gather and eat the bread. We have enough extra bread to feed the ducks. And this would be surprising to us because it wouldn't be uncommon for us to share our bread, to share food. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In fact, Jesus said, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. It must have been a strange thing for the Pharisees who were questioning Jesus to hear Jesus say, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. Today, as we focus on the Lord's Supper, I want to talk to you about Jesus, the bread of life. But first, I want you to take your Bibles and let's look at John 6, beginning in verse 41. John 6, verse 41, as we read the scripture, At this the Jews began to grumble. At this, meaning Jesus saying, I am the bread that has come down from heaven, they began to grumble. And I like to give you occasionally Greek words because you'll like the sound of this. At this the Jews began to go goodzu. There's something you can say this week when the kids are grumbling. No go goodzu. No grumbling. They began to grumble about him because Jesus said, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. They said, and this is a very important verse in this passage, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Verse 43. Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus said. Stop. Be quiet. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 45. It is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth, verse 47, Jesus said, He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Now what we see is Jesus creates conversation. Jesus creates conversation. I want to say that today, if you were to go um, 
this week to work or maybe at the university or maybe even in your home, maybe at a family gathering and you mention the name Jesus, there's always conversation. Sometimes people hear the name Jesus and they're angry. Sometimes people hear the name Jesus and they find themselves being skeptical. They doubt Jesus. Sometimes people hear the name Jesus and they think Jesus is a myth or a joke or a lunatic. Other people hear the name Jesus and it warms their heart. Jesus was discussing with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the kind of people who thought they knew everything. They had studied the law. They knew the Old Testament Torah of scriptures backwards and forwards. They knew all about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They knew about Abraham, his relationship with God, the great I Am. They knew about Moses and the children of Israel coming through the wilderness. And yet, they were missing the very heart of who Jesus was as the Messiah. They knew all about the Messiah, but they were missing who Jesus was. And so, when Jesus says, I am the bread who has come down from heaven, they begin to say, wait a minute. Is this not Jesus? Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Now you know what they were saying. They were saying, we watched that boy grow up. This is Jesus. We, we know him to be the son of a carpenter. That's the son of Joseph. And what they were also saying is, how in the world can he be saying, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. He's just a normal human being. They didn't understand that he was the Messiah. He was both God and man. He was the son of Joseph. He was also the son of man. He was also the son of God. And this they did not understand. And so there was this discussion. They talked about the wilderness. They talked about the manna in the wilderness that God provided. And Jesus said, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. And so what we began to see is that John is answering a question. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? And John is really saying, is this not Jesus, the Messiah? John actually does this all throughout the book of John. He begins in verse 1-1 by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He says that Jesus is the Logos. Jesus is the Word. He tells us who Jesus is in chapter 1, verse 14. That Jesus came, He's the incarnate God. He came full of flesh. He was full of grace and truth. In chapter 2, we begin to see Jesus, the miracle-working Jesus. In chapter 3, who is Jesus? Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. And he's part of the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee of Pharisees. And Jesus says to him, you must be born again. You must be born from above. You must be born more than flesh and blood. You must be born from above. And Nicodemus doesn't understand and Jesus says to him, I am the one who can give life. But we also get to chapter 4 and we see there's a woman at the well and Jesus is there. The woman goes, as is her Samaritan custom, to draw water at the well. And Jesus is there talking to her. And we see that Jesus shows compassion to her. But Jesus says, if you drink, you can almost imagine it happening, her cranking on a rope, maybe a bucket, and the water's coming up. And the water maybe is kind of dripping down in the well as she lifts it up. And maybe Jesus helps her pull the water out. And Jesus says, if you drink the water that I am made of, you will live forever. And she's confused. Water? I mean, water is to drink or to wash or maybe to wash your hands or your face. Maybe to cook with, she was thinking. But Jesus says, if you drink of the water that I give, you will never thirst. And so Jesus was saying, I am the person who satisfies your deepest thirst, your deepest longings. Who is Jesus? We get to chapter 5. And in chapter 5, what we see is that Jesus is at the sheep gate pool called Bethesda. There's a paralyzed man there and Jesus looks at the man and he says to the man, rise up and walk. Again, we see that Jesus is the miracle-working God. And then we get to chapter 6. 
It's that passage in Capernaum where people are on a hillside and Mark tells us that it's a spring day, the hill is very green and there are 5,000 to be fed and one of the disciples says, Lord, we don't have enough money to go and buy bread. And Jesus says to the disciples, have them be seated in rows. And there are five loaves, five pieces of bread, and two fish. And Jesus multiplies the bread and the fish and the 5,000, including the children, are fed. So it's more than 5,000. And now we get to chapter 6 where Jesus says, I am the bread who has come down from heaven. And the Pharisees are left scratching their heads. Everywhere you go, if you mention Jesus, there's a lot of controversy. There can be conversation. Several years ago, Newsweek magazine printed an article, and on the cover, they, the question was, who was Jesus? And in the article, it talked about Jesus. It had supposed biblical scholars talking about Jesus, who was married. It had supposed biblical scholars talking about the myth of Jesus. It had supposed biblical scholars making up all this stuff about Jesus that wasn't true. Gore Vidal, who wrote a book and talked about Jesus and said that Jesus, all around Jesus, there was always scandal that was swept under the carpet. It's amazing to me the kind of bizarre and strange and untrue things that can be said about Jesus. It's even more bizarre to me the kind of things that are done in the world in the name of Jesus. But who do we know Jesus to be? We know Jesus to be the son of Joseph, yes. The son of man, yes. The son of God, yes. We know Jesus to be the Christ who was born in Bethlehem in a manger. We know Jesus to be the person who lived in Nazareth. Later in John, they asked the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And they were saying no, but John records, yes, Something good can come out of Nazareth. Jesus, the bread of life. We know Jesus who lived. The miracle working Jesus. The Jesus who fed the 5,000. The Jesus who's met our needs, your very needs. The Jesus who loves us, who guides us, who gives us grace and truth. We need grace. We need truth. We know Jesus to be the one who went to the cross and shed his blood we know Jesus to be the one who rose again victoriously and we share in that victory. We have victory in Jesus. And so the question is not who was Jesus. The question is who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? When I was 10 years of age, I invited Jesus Christ into my heart. I'll never forget it. I'd been thinking about Jesus, the great I am. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I was in church on a Sunday night. I was 10 years of age. I was just a boy, but I was really praying and thinking about Jesus. And I remember during the invitation, a song given at the end of the sermon, I pulled my dad down to me and I said, he's really tall. And I said, I pulled him down to me and I said, uh, Dad, I want to invite Jesus into my heart. And he said, why don't we wait till you get home and talk about it? I said, no, now. He said, okay. So I walked down the aisle, and I never will forget the night I gave my life to Christ. I went the next day and had my first theological discussion. I was in fourth grade. My friend's name was Matt. And I said, Matt, I invited Jesus Christ into my heart last night. And he said, I'm Catholic. We were into deep theology pretty quick. I remember when I was baptized, how happy, what a time of joy. I can also tell you that following Christ is great joy, but sometimes things aren't always easy. Sometimes we go through difficult times. Sometimes we face challenges. 
Sometimes we face uncertainty. Sometimes we look at the world as if the world is collapsing. Sometimes we live through misery and pain. Sometimes we're jobless. Sometimes we have crises. Cancer enters the family. Or maybe there's tragedy and loss. Sometimes we don't know where to turn. But we're still reminded that Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. That He can satisfy our souls. That He can guide our lives. That He can give us grace and mercy when we need it. He can give us comfort because we're, we're grieving. He can put us on the right path even when, when we feel uncertainty because Jesus loves us. So Jesus creates conversation. He invites us into the conversation to know Him in a personal relationship as I invited Christ into my heart and my prayer is that you've done that in your heart. But we also know that Jesus offers nourishment for life. Look at verse 44. Jesus said in verse 43, Stop murmuring, stop gogudzu, stop grumbling and gossiping and, and talking bad about me, Jesus was saying, because no man can come to me except the Father who has sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Later John will say, if I be lifted up, Jesus said, I will draw him in and to me. This is the Bible's way of saying that even while you are searching for God or searching for meaning in your life because of the cross and the resurrection, Christ is searching you. He's seeking to draw you to Him. Today, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Christ is reaching out for you. He stands with open arms saying, come, come, come. He says in verse 45 that we are to hear of the gospel and we are to learn of the Father. And we are, in verse 46 and 47, we are to live for Christ everlasting life. And as we look at this passage, we see that what he speaks of, I am the bread of life. In Jesus Christ, there's nourishment for your life. Now, we spend a lot of time nourishing our lives, don't we? I figured out two things about Hong Kong. I figured them out yesterday, by the way. It's taken me two months. Here's the first thing I learned. Hong Kong... It's not just an island, it's a whole bunch of islands. I googled this yesterday, 263 islands. I went to Tao yesterday with some friends from church. They, we had a wonderful day and I told them at the end of the day when we were driving back, I said that your goal and the rest of the time that I'm in Hong Kong is to take me to all 263 <laughs> islands. Second thing I learned, I really, I've been thinking about this, but I really figured it out yesterday. In Hong Kong, you love to eat. <laughs> and eat. And eat. In Texas, you come to my house. We'll give you some Texas steak. We'll give you a baked potato with butter and cheese. We'll give you a salad and we'll give you bread and we'll give you lots of butter. We'll eat and we'll be done in 40 minutes. We'll clean the dishes and we'll go for a walk. In Hong Kong, I come to your house. We start at 1. We finish at 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm being funny. It's one of the great things about it, though. You eat, and you fellowship, and you visit, and you share. I love that about Hong Kong. This week in the United States, Jesse Ventura announced that he's considering a run for President of the United States. Good luck at that. He said if you know anything about him, that he wanted to think about running for President of the United States, but he used to be a wrestler in the States, the World Wrestling Federation. And then after his wrestling years, I'm building his body up with muscles, he ran for to be governor of the state of Minnesota, and he won. When he became governor of Minnesota, they asked him, what is it you're looking forward to in Minnesota 
What's the first thing you're looking forward to being governor of Minnesota in the United States? And he said, what I'm looking forward to is the food. My daughters used to watch this movie called Ever After. And in the movie Ever After, I can't even tell you what the movie's about. But they watched it so many times. There's one line in the movie and I could hear it. And then I got to where I would go places to eat. And I would say this when I would show up. Here's the line. I'm only here for the food. We know how to nourish the body, don't we? We buy fruit because we want to be healthy. We juice because we want to have healthy things in our bodies. We exercise, we walk, we take care, we nourish the body. But when Jesus said, I am the bread that has come down from heaven, He wants to nourish your soul. Church, what you need and what I need, we need the vitamins of the gospel. If I could plead with you each day to open the word of God, to take in the bread of life, to take in the word of God, to call on God as a refuge and strength and a very present help, to read God's word and take it in as nourishment for the soul, to challenge you to take in the nourishment of Jesus giving life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Christ wants to give you abundant life, but in your relationship with Him, you can't just nourish the body, you have to take time to nourish the soul. Richard Foster says that to nourish the soul, there must be three things. There has to be, first of all, in your heart and life, this deep, deep sense that you are going before God in Christ every day to live a life of simplicity, simple faith. And out of that, you're to develop a sense of solitude that what you do is you take time alone with God. And out of that, you're going to develop a sense of submission as if to say, Jesus, I want to obey you and follow you. And Richard Foster says, out of simplicity and solitude and submission, it begins to cultivate our appetites for the ways of Christ. In other words, we begin to taste and see that the Lord is good. In other words, we began to take in Jesus, the bread of life, through the Word of God, and we began to understand how Christ lived and how we are to live. In other words, we began to see Jesus as a bread of life. He nourishes the soul with the nutrients of His life-giving power. And we don't live with a dead existence, but we live with an abundance of life and the joy of Christ. And church, we need the grain of Jesus, to nourish us so that we can nourish others. Church, do you realize that this week you're going to go to work and feel the pressure? This week you're going to be in the neighborhood and weary. This week you're going to be on the MTR and see a lot of faces, strange faces, and you'll be pushing in the crowds. But Christ has called us, as He nourishes our bodies, our souls, He has called us to nourish others. To be compassion to a hurting world. To be encouragement to a world of discouragement. To be hope in a hopeless world. So when Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, what does it require? Notice what he says in verse 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. The word believes is often translated the word faith. To follow Jesus Christ, the bread of life, you must place your faith in Jesus Christ. Faith is a leap in the dark. Faith sometimes we don't always, we can't scientifically prove it, but we trust God by faith. We also place our hope in Christ. I would think that if we went to Zambia today, over 40% of the people there are hungry. If we went to the right spot in Zambia and we took a bag of bread, Maybe we took a big, uh, several bags of bread and we stood in one place and opened the bread and began to hand it out. People would gather around us. Some would think this is the hope they'd been praying for, the desperation they, they'd experienced, the very bread. They would, be, they would be fighting for the bread. This would be hope. More so the hope of Christ because Jesus is the bread of life for your soul. You need faith. You need to place your hope in Christ. And you need to acknowledge the love of Christ. When Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. He's bridging the gap of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses, God's love, providing 
manna bread in the wilderness. And now Jesus says to the Pharisees, He would be the bread that would be the provision for eternal life for their very souls. You know what's strange though? That the Pharisees had the Torah, God's Word. They studied it, they poured over it, they memorized it. They went to the temple. They practiced religious practice as Jews. They knew about the Messiah. They knew the Messiah was coming. But right in front of them, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. An introduction to them to say, I am the Messiah. And they never recognized Jesus. I hope today you recognize Jesus as the bread of life. Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago. And when he wrote the book, it was a story of him being imprisoned in Russia. He had criticized the Russian communist government in those days. And he was also an avowed, strong, outspoken Christian. And those two things landed him in prison for a long time. And when he was delivered... He was a former professor. He went on a worldwide circuit to give speeches and he went to Harvard. And when he got to Harvard, he stood up among some of the most brilliant students and professors in all the world and he gave this great speech. He began his speech with a very simple statement. In the West, men have forgotten God. Men have forgotten God. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. It's almost as if he was taking the the Pharisees and shaking them and saying, Don't forget God, He's right in front of you. I am the bread of life. Maybe it's as if Jesus stands in front of you and holds you by the shoulders with His tender care and says, I am the bread of life. Won't you believe in me and have everlasting life? I want you to bow your heads and hearts today in the Spirit of Christ as we move now to a time of the Lord's Supper. Jesus said, I am the bread of life.